that um, image of a sculptor. He's, an, he's a very famous modernist sculpture. He's called Ben Enwonu. Um, he's Nigerian. So today we're going to talk about form and content. And it's going to just be an introduction to what form and content is. Some of the topics are, um, first, we shall understand what viewing analysis is all about. Um, I'll give you a little exercise to do so that you're able to understand what um, this subject matter is all about. Then we will discuss the purpose of viewing um, analysis. We will then, um, I'll demonstrate to you how to view an art piece. And then we'll then, you know, define some of the, some of the phrases or words that are used in form and content. So we'll define what is subject matter, what is form, what is content, what is context. And then we shall finally finish with aspects of formal analysis um, and then do a little critique of an image. Right? So, I mean, everywhere we go, you know, they are all surrounded by art. So essentially, when you look around you, you will definitely bump into art, right? So it doesn't matter whether it's your, your, the dressing that you're wearing, you know. I'm wearing a beautiful, you know, patterned dress. That's some form of art. When you look at the buildings around you, the architecture, that's some form of art. When you look at the landscape, when you look at the scenery, that's some sort of art, right? So, and every single person has a reaction or impression about what they see in the real world, right? So, sometimes these responses are actually um, formed from a lifetime of knowledge and experience. So, for example, what someone would think of his sweater, you know, would be referenced by the experiences that, that they've experienced, you know? Um, that sweater could have different meanings for different people. And I think that's essentially what I'm trying to say. Um, and then, of course, I guess everyone knows that reference for, you know, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. There are some people who can view an art piece and say, I totally don't like it. Other people will be like, my gosh, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. And you see, all this is informed by their experiences and knowledge. Now, all responses are personal. And there's nothing wrong with the first impression. You know, sometimes you can even go back to an artwork or a movie or a painting and get different, you know, reference, uh, different references around it. You know, different, you can analyze it differently. I don't know if you guys have ever um, watched a movie. Then after a few years, then you watch again the movie and you see something different. You know, you always see something different or something more than what you saw before and so on and so forth. And that's essentially what we're, to what we're talking about. Viewing analysis is very personal and it keeps changing, right? And always remember that it's always your point of view. So no one is wrong and no one is right. Eh? So it's just a point of, of view. So I'd like to um, um, share some images and ask the class what, you know, just like three responses. When you look at these images, that's slide five. What do you see, right? What do you see? What do you see? Yes, what do you see? Yes, you see a fountain or a monument of sorts. Uh huh. What else do you see? What else do you see, guys? You don't recognize anything there? Which? I'm talking about the slide that has a red logo, some structure, and someone. So, so what else do you see on that page? Yes. The staff of who? Of Moy. Yes. So I think, um, so that's essentially what being analysis is. On this image, you can see a lot of things. So I think, in my mind, I see three things. I see the identity of Kanu. I see a monument that I've seen at Uru Gardens. I see Moi, right? That's the former president, or at least the second president of Kenya. 
So, and everyone sees different things. Like someone would see, like she said, a structure. She said, a fountain, you know. So, remember, that's part of what viewing analysis is. You can see so many things. I mean, um, in my, this is a president who was there during my time when I was your age. <laughs> Believe it or not. So, he represents also other things to me. He represents... Um, you know, a time when there was a single party, I remember, you know, we used to we used to stand on the road in primary and sing, Tawala Kenya, Tawala, when we saw the president's um, uh, convoy coming, we remembered, we know Kano as the only party that existed for a very long time. That time was also representative of dictatorial, dictatorship of sorts. You know, there were, in fact, we used to have this, we used to hear these um, stories are on radio, you know, that... People were fired on one o'clock news, you know, in, in government and, um, you know, and anything that was treasonous, you know, people would worry if they said things on a podium and there were politicians, they worried for their lives, you know, that their lives were in danger. So I think the thing is, um, many, as you can see, my personal experience around the images might be more deeper um, than yours is because perhaps this president did have a... Um, a big impact like this president did in my life, right? So viewing analysis also is dependent on things like time, influence, experience, and so on and so forth. So what is a visual analysis? So a visual analysis is also called formal analysis, right? And it's the analysis of a work of art, sculpture, or a piece of architecture, um, and even the landscape, you know, what we see around us. Visual analysis is the process of looking at a piece of visual art. Um, so from your movies to your videos to your Instagram feed on social media, paintings, photographs, and dissecting it for the artist's intended meaning and means of execution. And I want us to be very clear about what visual analysis is because it is really part of what we call art criticism. Right? So, how many of you guys know some, a, there's a career called an art historian? You can actually be an art historian. Right? So that's a career you can have. And uh, um, form and content informs that, that career. Right? How many of you know what uh, being a curator is? A curator, perhaps you work at an art gallery. Right? So curators also need to understand art very deeply, and essentially they're experts at visual analysis, right? So it's, so visual analysis is the foundation of any art historical writing and makes up the backbone of art history. So, um, so this is me saying that you will deepen your appreciation for art history by understanding how to, to visually analyze works of art. Um, it's also learned through observation, right? And um, it really is, you know, you making a very thorough study of the characterization of an, a piece of art. So looking at it, you know, walking back, walking forward, looking at it, finding out what the artist was doing, what medium they were working with, and so on and so forth. The formal elements which need to be considered when performing visual analysis of an artwork include the basic elements of art and design, right? So it's line, you know, you're looking at color, you're looking at the scale of the artwork, you're looking at the composition and space, you're looking at the medium, the technique, size of the artwork, and also the function. So what was this artwork for, right? And then, um, so what I'd also like to just mention is that when you're visually analyzing a work of art, it's always good to also understand the, the historical era, right, that it was created. So, and you'll hear this a lot in art history when you continue with your studies. Someone will ask you, okay, what's the painting? Say it's a Picasso. Which century? You know, you'd say 18th century, you know. Um, what year? 1937. What's the name of that art? The Weeping Woman. So you're able to actually um, put it into context. Someone tell me what happened in the 1930s. 1930s, 1940s. 
very significant era in human history. Please tell me what happened in the 1930s and the 1940s. Huh? Uh -huh. The what? The world, the world. Excellent. So the World War was happening in the 1930s. And if you look at some of Picasso's works during that time, they were very sad, you know, a crying woman. Because those are things he saw during his time. He saw women devastated, you know, decapitated children. I don't know if you've seen an, an, um, an artwork of his, and I'd like you to go study it. I'll mention it again. It's called Buena, Guernica, Guernica, right? So anyway, so the idea is that um, visual analysis also informs historical context and interpretations of meanings can also be welcomed during this, this um, a discussion. And what I'd like you guys to understand is that you become an expert when you also start thinking of the era. Like always, and that's why people ask you, what year was that drawing done, you know? And that's why you always see on the captioning of any art piece, they always reference the year. So it's for you to understand, is it modernist art? Is it contemporary art? You know, is it 20th century art? Is it 14th century art? Is it Egyptian, you know, uh, the antiquities time art and so on and so forth. So you should be able to make such references. So the next slide, the purpose of visual analysis. So um, there are many reasons, and I've mentioned already a couple, like you can actually build a career by being a very good visual analyzer of artworks, right? So if you go to any art gallery, the people you meet, um, the ones who run the shops primarily, are very good at critiquing art. You take them your piece of art, they'll be like, I don't want it, it's a copy. I already have seen it, you know? Or they'll be like, um, it's not quality material to sell, you know? Or they'll be like, my gosh, that's a masterpiece, you know? So they're able to actually critique art in such a manner that they are able to understand and even value it, right? And so besides just one of the purposes being that visual analysis can inform your career, there are other things that it can do. One is um, works are analyzed for historical significance and their impact on culture, art, politics, and the social consci consciousness of time. And I think that's quite self-explanatory. I've already explained the, the Guernica, or, or at least the other art painting of Picasso. It's called The Weeping Woman. These are paintings that were done during a time of war. And so um, visual analysis is able to contextualize some of these things. Then um, another purpose of visual analysis is to recognize and understand the visual choices the artist made in creating the artwork. The other one is to understand what exactly the viewer is looking and what the artist intends to convey. Um, so how many of you have ever seen a piece of artwork and you're like, wow, that's, I don't even understand what it is, right? So already by just saying, I don't understand what it is, simply means two things. Either you're an amateur at what visual analysis is all about, or you, it's so abstract that you may not understand what it is, but if you perhaps um, understood a little bit more about the artwork, you then will be able to perhaps guess at what it means. Perhaps if you knew the name of the artist, the way it was done, the, 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 perhaps the background of the artist, and so on and so forth, right? So I think, um, so it's a very fluid and flexible um, construct, right? That it can really melt, help you understand the choices that the artist took, right? It will also be able to um, prepare you to better understand what exactly the viewer is looking at and what the artist intended to convey. And then also another thing is to better understand the work as a whole. As I'd mentioned earlier, visual analysis is also part of art criticism, right? Um, so if you want to be an art critic, I don't know if you've seen British, British, normally it's a career you find in Europe. There are people who call themselves art critics. They're able to speak for like one hour about one art piece. <laughs> they're able to chamboy it because they've studied art history and they understand how to do visual analysis. They're able to tell you a story about the, the work. Right? Okay. 
right? So the next slide is how to view works of art. So, um, so this is a little exercise I want to encourage you to always do whenever you're looking at art. Um, you must always understand that works of art, there are three things that you need to look at. Subject, the subject matter, the form, as well as the context, the content, and the context, right? Then we often identify our work by its subject, right? That is, you can say, you know, that's Picasso's painting, it could be a landscape, the cover of this lecture is having someone doing a sculpture, and so on and so forth. Form, the form in, is the visual organization of the artwork, how the artist has used line, shape, color, and all those elements of art and design. And content is the impact or meaning of the work. So from a very basic level, those are what, um, what it is. So how many of you guys have seen this art piece? So there, there's a big image there of, um, of a painting, and the painting is called Sarakasi Asiasa. Also, in, also, also translated to the Circus of Politics. If you go to, there's, there's actually an exhibition um, recently, last year, and his work um, was exhibited. And the gentleman is called Joseph Batia, but he's also called Batias, right? And um, one thing I can say about his work is that it's extremely, so I'm just trying to show you how to do a visual analysis of work, right? So his work uses art as a social commentary. Like it talks about what's happening in society, the current affairs in society, right? And this piece actually tells Kenya's contemporary political climate using comics and cartoons, right? So Batias presents us with, um, you know, everyday happenings. You know, Mama Boga out there. You know, the, the chaos that happens during um, when you're at the bus stage, you know. There's always things happening, a lot of noise, you know. So you can see all these upheavals in our society are being depicted in one big um, picture. It also depicts, you know, the bigotries and the implications of Kenyan politics, you know, the fact that, you know, perhaps if you look at some of those pictures, you'll see that, you know, um, there's a lot of iniquity and sin that's going on, you know, and we're moving on, you know, you have people selling wares in the middle of the road and so on and so forth, and it's happening. I think you've seen the hawkers who on the road, you know, so it tells you the things that are really happening in our society, for real, right? And, and, um... He also lucidly critiques our politics, or can we call it politics? When they trick you on the podium, they tell you, please vote for me, you will see Mara Road up to your village, you know, things like that. He, he critiques that in visual art, saying, saying things that politics does, but look, the irony is it never happens, right? So it's, it's, and that's what we're calling visual commentary. He has a very good way of showing it, um, and, and he also represents the general attitude towards politics, you know, and politicians. So if you look at some people there, they really don't care. You know, us guys are moving on with life. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but hey, politics is for those who want to enjoy it. Me, I need to make a living. I don't care what's going on. Me, I just need to sell my, my mangoes and make my money and at least feed my family. So again, there's that very interesting play between the lifestyle, the realities on the ground, and the things that are happening in politics are to be ignored because really people know these are just things that are, we're being told and so on and so forth. So that's essentially what visual, analyze, uh, um, visual analysis is all about. You're able to look at a picture and put it into context, right? And if you notice, the year, did I indicate the year? I think it's a 2021 or 2022 picture. Yes, but I think uh, the... Yeah, I think it's a 2022 picture. So anyway, he painted it for many months. Eh? So this is one painting, but apparently it took him a lot of time, like perhaps a year. And remember, he was painting it during the electioneering year. So again, remember time reference, the historical references and interpretations are now coming to play. So there's also something else I'd like to mention about his work. So he does it in a very palatable but almost satirical manner. His works are distinctively edgy, and it's an honest characterization 
of the political illustration of Kenyan society of the Kenyan society. So, in layman's languages, language, the best way to describe his painting is that it's a lot, a whole lot. It's chaotic. You know, if someone was just to ask you what that painting is, you'd be like, my gosh, right? It's a lot, a whole lot, and it is chaotic, right? And um, it's so much so chaotic that he crams his canvas with several human, humorous, minute that only a keen eye can take notice. So I think if you look at that picture and zoom in, you'll see some funny instances. And apparently, um, Batias has a very interesting style, a signature. If you look at most of all his paintings, they have a cut. They always have this cut somewhere in the painting. So I challenge you to go look at some of his other works, right? So now I think with, with the definitions that I've given to you, sorry, with, with the context that I've given you, which is viewing analysis and visual analysis, let's now go deeper into defining some of the definitions that we use or some of the terms we use in form and content appreciation. So the first one is what is subject matter, right? So subject matter um, in art refers to the topic or focal point that an art piece is built around. And that's the easiest one. You know, when you look at it, you're like, it's a painting, you know? It's a painting of a market, right? So that's essentially what you would say um, of this work, the work of um, Batias, which is Sarakasi Yasiasa, right? So this may be, when you're looking at um, sort of articulating what the subject is, you would look at the person, you'd either be looking at a person, a still life, person being portrait, a still life, landscape, building, or other foundational elements. Um, it's also important to, to understand that subject matter of a piece of art is sometimes understood to be the meaning of the piece of art in totality. So it's, you know, just to just say it's a marketplace piece, sometimes it's even informed by the title of, of, of the art piece, right? So no matter what media is used to create a piece of art, it should have an identifiable subject matter, right? The subject matter of a piece can be anything and everything a piece of art is about. Um, and I think I've repeated that. It could be anything and everything that, you know, it could even be just a five-second digital ad, you know. That's already um, talking about the subject, you know. That's an ad you put, you see them on YouTube, they come and they go, and then you continue with your movie. So that's essentially what subject matter is. Then identifying the main subject of a piece of art is helpful for finding meaning in an art piece, right? Sometimes the subject of an art piece is clear because there is only one thing on the canvas. So I think this one is the easy one. When you start your phone, <laughs> that one logo that comes on will tell you what it is, right? So you know it's a Samsung, you know it's an iPhone, and so on and so forth. So even just that one logo um, can inform you on what, what that brand is, for example. Next is what is for. So form of what, form, um, the form of a work um, refers to all its visible elements and the particular way these things come together. So it's really what you see, right? So for example, the form of Batia's works, there are many things, right? So you can talk about the media, it's oil painting. You can talk about, you know, the color, is used, you know, bright, vibrant colors. You can express, you know, you can start talking about what informs the, you know, the, the picture of the painting. It's a lot of people, it's a market scene, you know, there's fruits, vegetables, plants, animals, ETC, and so on and so forth. So I'll list for you some of the things that you need to look at when you're just discussing what form is. So the first is the material, as I'd mentioned. Um, the painting, the, the picture you saw at the very beginning of this presentation is actually a sculpture, and the sculpture is being cast in bronze. It was, it's a bronze, it's a bronze um, sculpture, right? So, material also could be oil painting, you know, acrylics, it could be video, it could be wood, it could be steel, mixed media, photography, you know, um, and so on and so forth. 
The second part that informs form is the color. So I think everyone knows what color is. Um, but when you're talking about color, you also start looking at things, um, principles of color, right? And elements of color. So you start discussing things like tonal value, the saturation, is it monochromatic? The harmony is, are the colors harmoni are harmonized? Or are the colors vibrant? Are they neon? Are they, you know, psychedelic? And so on and so forth. So you, you start discussing color in a deeper way, right? Um, then there's the use of line. So I think the use of line is is what you've been taught in your you know drawing class. So if you look at line also, you can start discussing things like it's curved, angular. There's two two D perspective. You know there is um, a flow. It's irregular and so on and so forth. Then um, another the fourth dimension is the texture of surface. So you're able. So this is mainly in paintings. Like, I don't know if you know, pointillism is, is a technique that is used where someone uses the tip of their brush to make an art, an art piece. There's even impressionism also that's quite similar and borrows from pointillism. So again, um, when you look at an art piece, you're even able to tell the type, the genre of art, right? Um, you know, expressionism, you know, you'd be able to tell the sort of when you look at the texture, you're able to tell how this person came up with the artwork, you know, and so on and so forth, right? So, also you can look at, say, sculptures, and you're able to see the treatment on the on the surfaces. Perhaps it's rough, perhaps it's smooth, perhaps it's you know, um, you know, um, what's it called, repellent. It could be fluid, you know, and so on and so forth. So, very, be very descriptive. I guess when you're discussing form. Be extremely descriptive about what it is you're, you're seeing. Then the composition of the work. So I think this is essentially how the space has been organized um, or how the elements are put together. So again, this is sort of a mishmash of what line, color, and and uh, material choice would be like. But anyway, um, so like in the in the case of um, just um, Sarakasia Siasa, it is chaotic. You know, you could say. The composition of this work is chaotic. That's a way of describing the work. But also, you know, there are other ways you can describe um, composition. You could say uh, there's one-point perspective, there's three-point perspective, there's, it's a close-up, it's a zoom-in, it's a zoom-out, it's, you know, viewed from above. Um, viewed from above also could be called, you know, eagle-eye view or bird's-eye view. And viewed from the bottom is called worm's-eye view. You know, so so essentially, there are also different ways of, 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 of there, are, there are different ways that artists can interpret a subject matter, and these are things that you need to look out for, right? So also things like, you know, um, symmetrical, grid-like, and so on and so forth. Then there's also the scale or dimension of an artwork. So scale and dimension is basically how big is it, how small is it, and so on and so forth. And then the duration of the work and the length of time. The viewer is expected to engage with it, particularly with it, particularly of significance is a time-based work, um, such as a video performance. So again, if you look at, um, like if you're going to watch a play, you definitely know that play is going to last between 30 minutes to an hour, right? So that art piece is a du has a duration, right? Whereas paintings are, you know, let me just say they are in perpetuity. They are always there. You know, they'll always stand there until perhaps they disintegrate, whatever, because, you know, the oil sometimes can, can trans, uh, what's it called? The oil or the acrylic paint can sometimes start fading or chipping away from the canvas and so on and so forth. Like if you look at very old um, paintings, you start seeing them now degenerating. So I think Time, the length of time or the duration of the work is something that you also need to look into, you know, um, and so on and so forth. So, so I think those are the, those are really what, um, those are aspects of what form is. Um, and, and so we'll now then move to describing or defining what content is, right? So content is the subject matter of a work of art or design. So if you notice, subject and content go hand in hand. They are really symbiotic to each other, right? 
It reveals, it is revealed through the formal properties of the works and may be evidenced on a number of levels. So you're able to tell content um, immediately or obviously. For example, you can tell that's a market scene, right? Like in the case again of Joseph Batias, Sar um, Sarakasia Siasa, you can all already tell when I say weeping, the weeping woman, you can tell already it's a woman, right? Um, and then, of course, it could be an interior, it could be a functional object, or an abstraction. So again, content is really inform, it informs the subject matter that you're looking at. Then beyond this, the content may become more complex. And you see this a lot in non-representative art, you see this in abstract art, a lot of it. When it becomes complex and you can't even tell what's going on. Then it's about what is happening in the works, what meaning you derive from them, and whether or not they create a particular mood or reaction. So, um, I don't know if you've ever been to an art gallery, and then you just see someone standing in an art piece for many, many hours, many, many minutes, sorry, and they just start crying, you know. So, again, art can actually be very emotive. Like, it can make you feel certain things, um, or you look at certain, you know, and I like, and let me give the best reference, TikTok. I think all of you, I'm not on TikTok. I'm, I'm, I might be on TikTok, but I don't even go on TikTok. But I'm sure most of you enjoy the content there, don't you? It gives you a very nice high. Then you have to even force yourself. You're like, if I carry on watching, I'll never get my work done, right? And that's essentially um, a drug. It's the modern day drug. The idea of scrolling and listening and watching to funny, hilarious, you know, content. That is... 21st century is drug, right? Because um, literally, there's, there's a, it's, if you study the nature of how social media is trapping the youth, um, you will understand what I'm trying to say. That that content is really deliberately packaged that way so that you stay on for longer, so that the brand can be able to put ads on that platform, so that they're able to make money off those ads. And you know, and you guys, all you do is you waste all your money there <laughs> without knowing your data bundles are over and so on and so forth. So the idea is to always be conscious about what is going on, right? So I want you to start looking at everything you do and enjoy as art and critiquing it with what we're learning today, right? Um, and perhaps you'll spend less time on some of these platforms because <laughs> you know it's deliberate, right? So, and someone else is making money off you. So anyway, um, so the idea here is that um, um, the formal, so, so sometimes it's difficult to assess um, content because it may be ambiguous or obscure. I've already explained TikTok and the power of TikTok and why it's powerful. <laughs> I hope you've learned something. So the other thing is the formal elements of the work and its title can often help to read the content as can recurring patterns motifs or symbols that may may have special significance. So again, I'll reference just something you saw. If you look at the logo of uh, Kanu, it's a Jogo. And, you know, I think back in the day when I was young, you know, Ulikuna Skia, phrases like, hey, Jogo America, you know, like the man, the person, the person in power has spoken, you know. Jogo was just, the, it was sort of a metaphor of the actual, you know, jogo, the, the, the cockerel. You know, the way a cockerel usually is sort of, you know, has many hands around it. And also in the morning, it's the one um, cockerel that actually wakes up everyone, you know. So again, these just sort of metaphors are drawn from real life and also are incorporated in works of art, right? Perhaps right now, um, you may associate the cockerel with Sauti Sol, right? But back in the day, before Sauti Sol became Sauti Sol um, and had a logo of the Engoho, because I know that's where it comes from, because I come from the very same tribe they come from, and I know what how special a meaning um, chicken has for our community, you wouldn't be able to tell the genesis of it. So the genesis of their logo is not only informed by the tribe, but it's also informed in the era they lived in. They lived in an era when um, they only saw one logo of one party, which is Kanu. 
And you see, as a brand, it strongly lent itself to it. And it was unconscious. For them, it was unconscious. But their brand is also very strong because it bears a similar semiotics with the, the previous um, party. I think the party still exists, but not as strong as it used to be. So again, starting to look at art in that manner, you know, starting to critique and ask yourself, why do they have that logo in that one manner? You know, like I'd like to challenge you, go read about the genesis of the Apple logo. Like Apple, you know, John, John Stevens, the Apple logo. That's one of my favorite brands. So go read it and critique it and understand, and understand a little bit more about how the logos are also designed, right, and developed. So um, what is context? What is context? So context helps us to understand the meaning of a work of art. So I think, so this is what it is. If you're able to tell the subject, the form, the content, if you're able to successfully tell all these things, then you definitely will be able to understand and derive the context or the meaning of that piece of art. Right? So, and I guess that's why, I'll give an example, that's why people love um, new ideas in art. So, for example, Afrofuturism. I don't know if you know what Afrofuturism is. Has anyone seen Osborne Mashaya as well? Does anyone know who Osborne Mashaya is? Raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, only one person knows who Osborne Mashaya is. Okay, so I challenge you to go Google Osborne Masharia. He is the godfather of Afrofuturism. In my in my view, he is extremely big. Um, he's extremely well known in in the global north, like sort of worldwide, as being a guru at Afrofuturism. So anyway, context takes into account several things, right? One is the social and historical millennium within which the works were produced. And that's what I was saying. The moment you understand what form, content, um, the, the form, content, and subject are, you're able to understand the context. Like you're able to, 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 to um, sort of now interpret what the, what the art is all about. So it will also inform the movement or period of which the art belongs. And that's why you'll always hear people say, "Oh, that's modernist art," you know, "Oh, that's Dadaism," "Oh, that's Bauhaus." Well, that's um, Rococo art, and so on and so forth. It's because people know what era that artwork was done by just simply looking at it, right? And then um, sources referencing the work, such as the work of other artists, literature, Asian mythology, and popular culture. So you're able to tell some of these things, right? Also, you're able to tell where, how the work is exhibited or performed. Um, so I guess, like in the picture I was, we were doing a visual analysis of, whenever you see that monument, you already even know where it is. You know it's in Nairobi. You know that monument happens to be in Uhuru Gardens. You know, you exactly know, perhaps it was built during the, the you know, when we gained independence. At least you can take a guess that it was, because it bears certain iconography that really pay homage to the, the independence we got as Kenyans, and so on and so forth. So you're able to actually create this contextual interpretations of a piece of art, right? And then um, the culture and personal background of the artist can also become evident. And I think this is something that you will only learn with time as an expert. Um, so for example, for African art, it's easy. When you look at the art, you're like, that's an African who did it, right? But when it comes to Europeans, you know the different types of Europe, Europeans. So um, Picasso has a very different style. Do you know that she's Hispanic, you know? And so on and so forth. So you should be able to also start looking at a piece of art and you're able to tell, that's a French, you know? That's a, you know, that's a Kenyan. That's a, you know? I mean, that's when you now become a true expert at um, visual analysis, right? So now we'll go a little bit deeper around what um, aspects of formal analysis is all about. And we'll just take some, you know, 10 minutes going through it so that you're able to understand the four aspects of formal analysis, right? So there are only four. And 
it all informs the descriptors you've just described, right? So the first one is called description. I would like you all to be able to describe a piece of art. Two, I want you to also be able to analyze a piece of art, both visually and audibly. Because right now we are doing, there's a lot of that. Eh? When you look at video content, it's no, long, it's no longer just the visual. It's also what you're hearing, right? Also, there's the interpretation of art. So now, based on your personal experience and knowledge, you're able to interpret this art, right? So you should be able to do that. And the last one is evaluate it, right? Remember what I was trying to tell you about critiques and curators. These are the four things they must be able to learn and know and master. Because there's no way um, a, a curator can value a piece of art if they cannot do all these four things. Be able to describe it, analyze it, interpret it, and evaluate it. So we'll go through the first one so that I can just take you through what questions should be going on in your mind as you do description. Now, let me say this here and now. When I ask you to, um, to do a critique, or if I ask you to analyze a piece of art, this is what I mean. I mean you to describe it, to analyze it, to interpret it, and to evaluate it. I hope we are clear. Please raise your hand and say we are clear, because I'm going now to describe. So the thing is, I don't want to see someone write me two paragraphs and tell me they've done an analysis of a piece of art. Am I clear? Am I making myself clear? As you can see, I need to see at least a paragraph on description. I need to see a paragraph on interpretation. I need to see a paragraph on um, analysis, and I need to see a paragraph, finally, of your evaluation. And the evaluation would be different. I do not want to see, um, sorry, I don't know your name, so I'll just say Robert. I don't want to see Robert's evaluation being similar to Amaran's. How can that happen? All of you, you see the way I describe things is very different from how you describe it, right, as an individual. So, from, at the, particularly between interpretation and evaluation, Everyone has their own interpretation of something. Remember, we're not in a pure math class where the answer pi is 3.16. It cannot be, right? We are in a subjective class and it's called art. And I want to see everyone's views. Like I want to, I want to hear what you have to say about something. And remember, no one is right, no one is wrong. But you need to be informed by studying the subject, the form, the content and the context. Are we clear? Higher. So I'll describe now what description is. Description is, what did you notice at first glance? Right? So ask yourself that question. Is it 2D? Is it 3D? Is it audiovisual? What is the medium? Right? What kind of actions were required in its production? Was it etched? Was it um, curved? Was it painted? And so on and so forth. What are the elements of design used within it? Also, when you're describing, you can also start thinking of phrases like, is it soft or hard? Is it jagged or straight? Is it expressive or mechanical? How, is it, how can you describe that art piece in space if you were just to describe it? right? Also, consider shape. Are the shapes large or small? Hard-edged or soft? What is the relationship between shapes? Do they compete with one another for prominence? What shapes are in front? What, which ones fade in the background? What is dominant? What is receding? And so on and so forth. Indicate mass or volume, particularly in sculpture. There are people who make sculptures that take over a roundabout, right? So that's that's what I mean. Or there are some people who make art and jewelry is part of it that is minute, right? So again, um, is it 2D? Is it 3D? Is it um, digital? And so on and so forth. Okay, um, what means, if any, are used to, dis to give the illusion that the presented forms have weight and occupy space? and so on and so, so forth. So just start thinking about such things. Then organizing the space, does the artist use perspective? 
do they go, go, you know, I don't know if you've heard of sticks and, it's called what? Stickman drawings. Like a child, right? Um, is it a linear perspective? Is it, there's a horizon line, is there a vanishing point? And I guess that lends to perspective as well. So, and then on texture, ask yourselves questions like, how is texture being used? Is it actual or implied? Right? So I'll show you an art piece that was created with fingers, like this. Someone paints with their fingers. And so you see these, these strokes. So the visual strokes are in your mind, but you can see them. You can see this is a fingers that were used to paint, right? I'll show you an art piece that looks like that. Right? Um, or is it, you know, stone? Stone has this rough texture. So you're able to describe it in that sense. Then in terms of color, what kind of colors are used? Is there a color scheme? Is the image overall light, medium, or dark? You know, because certain, certain, the way uh, the tone and shade of colors are depicted can also inform on the mood, you know, like sort of, if it's so dark, it's perhaps, it's 14th century, it's chiaroscuro, you know, a play of art and, and dark. They had this fascination for it. Um, and it's somber. It could be somber mood, you know, because it's so dark. Perhaps people were hungry, they were dying, and the English Empire had really lost control, and so on and so forth. You know, so you're able to also depict, you're also able to describe such things. It's dark because it forms a certain era or a certain mood in time. And then, so we'll go to the next one. So that's description. Analysis. So once the elements of art have been identified, next comes questions of how these elements relate to each other. So how are they arranged? Um, how are the principles of design employed? You know, what elements in the work are used to create unity and provide variety? How have the elements been used to do so? What is the scale? Is it large scale? You know, and so on and so forth. Um, are there proportions? Is it disproportionate? I think you've seen. Um, there's this lady on Instagram. She draws herself in very interesting miniature forms. Eh? So she could, she could be in a cup, or she could be the handle of a cup. Um, she, could be, she could be like a fairy on a leaf. So the leaf is what's gigantic, and herself, she's there. She's seated on a leaf. She's called who? Chaps. Cha? Mini chaps. Mini chaps. Yeah, that lady. I think you know her on Instagram. So she, she, that's a very, she has a very interesting style of being a minute in her own works. And she does a lot of post-production on Photoshop to depict whatever, you know, social commentary or art commentary she's depicting. And, and yeah, usually it's informed on everyday things, right? So um, look at her work. She has a very interesting style. Another thing around analysis is, you need to check for things like, is it asymmetrical, symmetrical, and so on and so forth. What is used within the artwork to create emphasis, you know? Um, and we'll do this, we'll actually do this practically at the very end of this class. How has movement been conveyed in the work, for example, through line or placement of figures? Are there any elements within the work that um, create rhythm? Are any shapes or colors being repeated? And so on and so forth. So I think when it comes to um, analysis, you're, very, you're now critiquing as a designer, you know? using the principles of art and design to describe that specific um, art piece that you're viewing. The third one is interpretation. Interpretation comes, so interpretation is very individual, and that's how I was saying, when I give you an assignment, kindly make sure that every single person's voice is, 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 um, is shared, right? Because everyone's interpretation is also very different, right? So, and that's why that first point says, interpretation comes as much from the individual viewer as it does from the artwork, right? It derives from the intersection of what an object symbolizes to the artist and what it means to the viewer. It also often record, records how the meaning of an object has been changed by time and culture. And it's also a process of unfolding, right? So you're able to then now step back and say, what did I think? about that work, right? So it's your views, your opinion, right? And so a work that may seem to mean one thing on first inspection may come to mean something else 
when studied further. Next slide. Just as when we're reading a favorite book or you're watching a movie, you're able to often sort of, you know, perhaps not have a very deep interpretation about it, but then when you watch it again, you have a deeper interpretation of what you saw. Like, I had to watch The Matrix twice for me to understand what was going on, you know. There are certain movies you watch and you're like, I, I don't even know what's going on. But when you watch it a second time, you kind of now understand what was going on. You know that, that, that button for rewind, then you watch again. So that's it. That's what you're doing. You're trying to interpret what it is you saw and then derive meaning so that when you continue with the movie, you're able to understand the movie better. Am I making sense? Right? So, um, claims about meaning can be made, but are better when they are backed up with supporting evidence. So, for example, I wouldn't expect you to look at a painting like the one for Batias and go telling me, you know, um, like you go fibbe. Let me give you a fib that I can imagine someone say. Oh, you know, Joseph Batias in this Arakasi Asiasa was depicting how black Americans are being, you know, are suffering uh, due to, you know, the segregation and the slavery. Imagine now someone writing like that. See any guesswork? Isn't that guesswork? So there's guesswork and there's interpret interpretation. You can't be talking about the images looking like they are black Americans and I don't know, they look like they are undergoing slavery and so on and so forth. I mean, that simply means you didn't do your homework. First, you don't understand what the subject is. You don't understand what the, what the content is, including the context. So... What I'm saying here is, as much as I'm saying interpretation is your own personal view, it should be informed and backed by the three things I've mentioned. The subject, the form, and the content. So don't just come up with your own imaginings of what's going on. And if I see it on a paper, I'll be very upset. Because I know you'll be guessing. Don't talk about something that you're not sure of. Because that would simply mean that you're misleading someone who's reading your work. Am I making myself clear? Yeah. So this is the tricky part. Normally, interpretation and evaluation are the tricky parts. That's where now uh, we know whether you really are an expert at um, interpreting what you've just viewed, right? And then finally, um, interpretation can also change, and some interpretations are better than others. So I think this you see, um, I don't know if you know Rotten Tomato. These are, this is a company that just goes around grading or rating movies. So sometimes you'll see, and if you compare, and there are different platforms that do that. Sometimes Rotten Tomato could say, hey, this movie, um, let me give an example of a movie, Sound of Music. Hey, Sound of Music has scored 9 out of 10. Whereas you go to another platform, they've rated it at 5 out of 10. So then you wonder, why is it that it's 5 out of 10, and on Rotten Tomato it's 9 out of 10? But perhaps it's because there are certain things that Rotten Tomato felt that they appreciated about a certain style or a technique, and that's why the score is high. Whereas these other guys perhaps looked at something and they're like, ah, we've seen that, you know, we've seen that somewhere else, they were copying somewhere, etc., etc., and that's why we're scoring it a 5 out of 10, and so on and so forth. So essentially, um, what I'm just trying to say is, interpretations vary, and also with time, they could even change as well. Eh? So, uh, now, um, we'll go to the last one, and the last one is a simple one. So, evaluation can always be like a one-liner, you know, like what I've just said. Like, that movie is the best movie I've watched this year. <laughs> that could be an evaluation, right? So, um, evaluation is after you have seen, you know, you've done your visual analysis, you've done, you know, all the us, you've, basically you've literally done your interpretation. An evaluation is sort of now to describe, analyze, interpret, and then have just the one goal of what it is you think about this work, right? So, so your evaluation includes what you've discovered about the work, um, or as you examined it, what you've learned about the work, and of course, others in the process. So it's it's really the most critical or important contribution to what you think you have understood about that art piece, right? So I don't know how to put it, but it's so. What you'd ask yourself is, what's my now reaction after I have interpreted it? 
what's my reaction to this piece? How do I feel about it, right? Do you like the artwork or you don't, you know? How do you find it visually pleasing? In some way, is it disturbing? Is it emotionally engaging? So I think these are just the questions that you ask yourself. Um, and I'll go back to the Guernica. If you look at that painting, it was around that period, 1930-something. It was also painted around that time. I'm telling you, that mural, when it was put in, um, in a hall, I think he, he was almost thrown in jail. It depended where it was put. For some, it was like he was a hero. You know, Picasso. Picasso was almost, you know, like everyone revered him because you were like, yes, this is the true story that people, are, humans are suffering. You know, um, we really love the way you've captured it. But to some, now the ones who are the, the, the aggressors, when they saw this painting, they were like, wewe, nini ni unafanya. You know what I mean? So essentially, um, as I said, uh, as I said earlier, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Some people might like it, some people might hate it. And that's simply what it is. Eh? It's what it is. It's all dependent on everyone's personal experience. So all of you are able to interpret art in your own individual way, as well as evaluate it. And no one's opinions or views are wrong or right. right? So it just depends. It's, it's just all good, whatever it is you view whatever it is your views are, sorry. So I think in summary, I'll close. Evaluating and judging contemporary works of art is more difficult than works that are hundreds of thousands of years old because the verdict of history has not yet been passed on them, right? Um, the other thing is that museums are full of paintings by contemporary artists who are considered the next Michelangelo, but who have since faded from the cultural forefront. Um, yeah, I think that's also true. The best art of a culture and period is that work which exemplifies the thought of the age from which it is derived. Um, and what we think about our own culture is probably not what, what would be thought of it in a century from now. Um, so I'll give you an example. Like, do you know Goth? I don't know if you've heard of Goth. Goth. Goth as a movement. Gothic. Gothic movement. Do you know Gothic movement was like... Uh, it was religious. It was a religious construct. But right now, when you see people packing black, wearing blacks, jinini, putting studs and things, you know, that's, that's become, we interpret it differently. God is now a certain, you know, towards the rebellious, um, it's a rebellious culture. I don't know if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if you guys are reading what I'm trying to say. So anyway, um, that's how art is. If someone was living in the era of goth, um, their views of what gothic art is, is very different from if they teleported themselves 100 years later and looked at the very same goth, they'd be looking at it very differently. They'd be seeing it in a very different way. So in their time, it could be that it wasn't dark, it wasn't, um, it was perhaps even, you know, spiritual, but now, 100 years later, it is dark, you know, it is rebellious, it is and so on and so forth. So, but I think um, why I'm telling you all this is because I know in your third and fourth year, you will do um, history and you will be exposed to Gothic art and you'll see what I mean, right? So don't worry, I'm just ahead. Then finally, the art that we believe best embodies our time, maybe, may or may not last, right? As time moves on, our evaluation and judgments of our own time may not prove to be the most accurate ones. Um, we live in a world full of art, and it's almost impossible to avoid making evaluations possibly mistaken about its value. And then nonetheless, informed evaluations are still possible and useful even in the short term. So what that simply means is that, you know, it's, I think because we live in an era where there's a lot of technological, art is being made every second, you know, TikTok, let me just go back to my reference. So the problem with, um, with the time we're living in is, the art is very short-lived, you know? You don't get time to digest, interpret, and evaluate it, right? And that's why there's so much competition, basically, amongst these artists who are on TikTok. And, and, and perhaps that's why it's harder to, to do the evaluation. Like, people don't now evaluate. They just look, they say, we like it or not, you know? In fact, evaluation has just boiled down to, do I like it or I don't? Moving on swiftly, you know? Next, next, next. So um, it's a really sad thing for art because 
art was revered back in the day and people only showed what it is they wanted to show when they had completely finished it well. But in the era we are living in, even if it's just nonsense, someone you see it put posting on social media, whatever it is, and they're calling it art. So I think, um, you know, but that's subjective. In my mind, it's subjective. To you guys, it might be something different. It may be that you enjoy that short form content, even if it's half-baked. But um, all, all we're saying is that uh, the more people create art, the more we're bombarded by it, and therefore, the less we, we really fully appreciate it through the visual analysis we, we ought to do as creators, right? So, um, I'll stop here by saying, um, I'd like us to just look at this picture for like one second and, and just appreciate what went on, right? So, it's, it's a painting, I'm not sure by whom. Um, it's called Katrina, that's what, what it's called. But if you look at this art, um, and what we're really doing is actually a visual analysis. When you look at this painting, you see a sad girl, right? You see her, and you see these other people, men at the background, and there's someone who's holding back. Um, you know, the ones who are running to help have been held back. And there's a photographer right there who's trying to take what? A picture. So that's essentially what the subject matter is. It's a little girl who looks lost and sad. And there's this person who's holding back um, the ones who are meant to be helping her so that a picture can be taken. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot that can be described from a form point of view, from the landscape that is jagged, meaning there must have been a bomb that flattened that place. You know, perhaps someone's parents, the girl lost her parents. You start looking at, you know, um, there's dominance um, brought to the fore, or at least there's a focal point around the girl because she's at the foreground. And at the background, we see, you know, an endless mass of devastation, including these other people who are behind. And of course, there's this, you know, interesting angle, diagonal angle, where we see this photographer trying to take the little girl. So I think. Um, you know, and you see a teddy bear here. I mean, really, it's really sad. Like, you can see this child is from an affluent, um, I guess, okay. I guess toys in the West is basic, but like, <laughs> that's me interpreting my own things. But the idea is that um, you should be able to interpret a piece of art like that from a form point of view, right? And you can also start just speaking about, you know, what's that red? The red is the only color that is striking in the art piece, and it's very deliberate because red is a color of, you know, danger. It's a color of passion, emotive. Um, in this instance, it demonstrates there was blood that was shed, you know. It's also a symbol for the Red Cross. We're able to tell it's a logo that identifies these people as being the rescuers, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot there that you can also say. You can also talk about um, literally the metaphor or what what exactly is the, you know, when they tell you what is the theme. <laughs> the theme is to show how the media are very um, brash when they're trying to chase a story. You know, it's a do or die. Me, I want my story. I don't care. Let the girl cry for a few minutes. I take my pictures, then you can carry on. You know what I mean? So it shows how sometimes, so it's, it's, it's really the irony. The irony is, that we enjoy, we enjoy this content, but sometimes these media people go to great lengths to actually get their story, and sometimes it's not in good, in a, in a good light. Like they can go to extremities, even to um, stop rescuers from doing their thing for them to capture that perfect, you know, photo, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot there to be said about the theme and. And, and the views about it, and that's essentially what I'm talking about, which is interpretation as well as evaluation. Now, um, and I think from an evaluation point of view, just to close, the picture to me depicts a child's helplessness when a situation like war has happened, and also it shows um, how thoughtless the media can be when they're trying to capture a story. And that's it. So haven't we done a full 360 of what we've just learned today? A hand clap for me.
Thank you.